the globe from Gurgaon, Haryana. I am Kais Kokho on behalf of the Naga Scholars Association. Welcome you all to the technical session, day three of the international webinar on living in the present, Nagas in the 21st century. The session is titled as Diaspora and Globalization. Uh, we have a inter uh, very interesting and promising lineup for the session. The speakers and the chair are drawn from an array of academic disciplines who are excelling in, in their own chosen fields. Without much ado, uh, let me straight away avail the privilege to introduce them to the house. Uh, first, we have the chair, a prominent anthropologist, Dr. Viba Joshi of the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology, University of Oxford, UK, uh, who is more Naga than do many Nagas in terms of our knowledge and intellect about the Nagas of the past culture and traditions. Uh, we have a lot to learn, particularly young scholars like me from her and her works, uh, which are widely published in book forms, journal articles, and many more. Uh, thank you, Dr. Viba Joshi, for joining us. Uh, your presence, interventions, critical comments on the work to be presented, to be presented will make a huge difference to the whole exercise. Uh, now let me come to the uh, presenters. Uh, we have Professor Ajailu Numai as the first presenter. Uh, she is currently the head Center for the Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy, the University of Hyderabad. She did her postdoc from Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies, University of Iowa, USA. She was the first Carter Fellow, Iowa City, USA, uh, 2006 to 2007. Uh, she's one of the pioneers in establishing the Center for Women's Studies, University of Hyderabad. She is a member managing committee of uh, Indian Sociological Society. Uh, she has also served as the convener of migration and diaspora of the Indian Sociological um, Society. Um, I must mention here that she's one of the youngest uh, scholars in India to have promoted to uh, professorship. Uh, thank you, Professor Ajailu, uh, for joining us. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Achinglu Kamai, who teaches in, uh, in the English department, Akma Ram Sanathan Dharma, uh, Delhi University. She did her PhD from JNU. Um, she has published a collection of folk stories titled Naga Tales, published by Down. Uh, she is currently working on her next book of folk tales titled Morning Blush and a collection of poems, uh, Flower of Remembrance. Uh, her poems have appeared in books like Caravan, Global Warming, Anthologies of Poems and International Journals, set to Poetry, Poet Journal of Haiku and Sairu, IFT and other places. Uh, she has presented several papers in both national and international conferences and several papers were published as chapters in books. Uh, she is also an ultra runner, having run numerous marathons and ultra marathons. She lives in Delhi with her husband, two daughters, and Haru the cat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chinlu, for joining us. Uh, next, we have uh, Tunjambeni Kitan, Associate Professor in the Department of History and Archaeology, Nagaland University. She specializes in history of Northeast and modern Indian history. Unfortunately, uh, she will not be able to join us due to uh, a date in the family. We extend our deepest commiserations to the family. Um, on behalf of the NSA, I convey the same to the family. Um, next, we have um, Simraisa Chohang Nao, uh, who is a doctoral candidate at the Center for African Studies, uh, School of International Studies, um, Jawaharlal Nehru University. His area of interest includes ethnicity, indigenous studies, sociology, and socioeconomic, um, socioeconomic problems of tribal society. He's currently working on the role of traditional leaders in um, South Africa politics. Uh, 
the last but not the least presenters we have here is uh, Ngutoli Su, who is Assistant Professor Zunabuto Government College, currently a doctoral candidate of the Department of Cultural Studies, Tezpur University. Uh, she was a gold medalist of ancient history, Madras University for her postgraduate degree. Uh, her works have been published in different edicted volumes, journals, and presented in several regional, national, and international seminars and conferences. She has taught, she has also taught at uh, Texo College, Nagaland from 2008 to 2013. Uh, she is a proud mother of two toddlers, aged three and one year. Thank you, um, Nutulisu and Sunraiso for joining us. And finally, and also importantly, we have the session reporters, Apila Santam uh, from the Center for Indo-Pacific Studies, JNU and Mitu Liu Ipao Center for uh, Way Session Studies, JNU. Uh, before I hand over the time to the chair, a uh, request to the participants here to kindly type your comments, observations, and questions in the chat box for uh, better time management and coordination. Um, thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Chair Dr. Viba. You may take over the time now. Uh, ah. oh. okay. Um, thank you for inviting me for this very interesting session and very important session uh, because we know about diaspora, diaspora, both sort of migration, which is um, outside into other countries and within the Indian states. And we have seen during the COVID and certain other uh, times when how suddenly in the diaspora situation, the way people behave towards each other can really change. And during COVID time, it has accentuated. Uh, but what about how people in everyday non-contingency time, how do they organize themselves in the diaspora? You can go there and me, myself being a diaspora person in the UK, how do we relate to each other? Do we seek out our community members? And how does it happen that there might be people from different Naga communities and how do we relate to them? Is there an organization or some such thing? And so it will be very interesting. I think I would, without taking much time now, we would go straight to the papers and then during the discussions, we can bring out several points. And it is possible that not all points uh, may be covered in the paper due to the shortage of time. We have about 15 minutes for each uh, speaker but we can all take up certain points in the discussion. So we must remember that we may not be able to cover everything in the short paper. Um, I would invite um, Professor Numai to begin her paper and her paper is titled, um, Migration and Cultural Identity of the Naga Diaspora in the United States, a Sociological Perspective. Please Thank begin. You. Thank you so much. Uh... Professor Viva, and uh, I also would like to express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Zusamo Yanthan and Koko and the entire uh, NSA team for inviting me to speak in this three days international conference. Uh, I must congratulate them for bringing together a galaxy of Naga scholars and particularly those who work on the Nagas from across the globe. And particularly, I feel honored to be chaired uh, by Viva Joshi, whom I deeply respect for her academic scholarship and her love for the Naga people. Uh, I remember in the inaugural session on the first day, uh, Professor Paul Pimomo has set the tone for the conference and mentioned the significance of Nagas living away from their homeland by stressing that they're able to understand the Naga issue from um, outside lens much better. Now to start with, uh, this paper attempts to understand the motivation of Naga diaspora for migrating to the land of greener pastures, assumed to be flowing with milk and honey, although the US is losing its charm currently. Metaphorically, uh, the concept of uh, 
milk and honey um, symbolizes the ecstasy, uh -oh. prosperity, wealth, endearment, and the like. You know, if we look at the book of Exodus, God said to Moses that he would bring him out of the affliction of Egypt to the land flowing with milk and honey. Similarly, in Genesis, in the beginning, God told Abraham to leave his country, his people and father's household and go to the land he will show him. You know, that set a kind of metaphor for the land of greener pastures. The Naga diaspora reminisces about homeland and they are deeply concerned about their people's well-being and uh, they attempt to preserve their cultural identity as naga but changes are observed in their values lifestyle dietary habits and viewpoint now this paper emphasizes the challenges of naga diaspora that includes the process of assimilation integration with their host uh, society pattern of adjustment, you know, in, um, in the new terrain and retaining their cultural heritage. Now, some of the questions that arise as to how the Naga diaspora maintain a relationship with their family, kinship and clan in the homeland. What is their perception on current political scenario? How are they involved in building their homeland? Are they giving back their skills, uh, knowledge, their ideas and also remittances uh, to their homeland. You see, other diasporas like the Gujaratis, um, Punjabi, especially from the UK, Telugus, Tamils, and Kanadigas from India, and also the Jews diaspora and the Chinese diaspora are exemplary in building their homeland, particularly their villages, their town, hometowns, and cities. Are there a lot of scholarship available on this diaspora? They were recognized and appreciated for building the drainage systems, uh, the village parks, you know, um, uh, schools, hospitals, drinking water facility, technology for agriculture, and the like for underprivileged people in their homeland. Now, among the Naga diaspora, there are lesser number of uh, highly skilled IT professionals, information technology professionals, architects, uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, medical practitioners like the doctors, professors, researchers, and the like who earn enormously well in the US. The Naga diaspora in particular, and also the Northeast diaspora in general are far behind in building their homeland with resources since they are still attempting to establish themselves, buy a house, buy a car, send their children to schools, colleges and universities uh, in their home uh, host country. Hence, you know, they, in my observation, they are more akin to the old Indian diaspora who struggle to send back remittances to India. Now, the new, uh, the new Indian diaspora are considered um, as uh, the successful knowledge diaspora who earn probably more than 10 times than the old diaspora and capable uh, to invest in their homeland as compared to the old diaspora. Uh, another thing is, uh, let me just briefly focus on research methodology that I use. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is a working paper. My field work haven't completed. I just started uh, in September. And I employ uh, obviously online observations, uh, uh, purposive sampling method with an individual interview and case study. Um, and it is, you know, uh, I have received uh, seven responses so far and expecting more. I've distributed to 30 people. And the selected respondents belong to different Naga tribes from Nagaland and Manipur, uh, who lives in various cities across the US. I also use snowballing sampling method where I requested the respondents to introduce me to other Naga diaspora. Now I found this method helpful to me because I'm able to create a cordial relationship with the new respondents. The generalization in this study emerges out of the responses that I received so far. Now the targeted unit of analysis in this study are 30 people, as I mentioned, 
and they represent the voices of the Nagas in the US. I know it's a small sample, but nonetheless, the study seeks to argue that the judicious responses can establish in mapping the cultural identity with their homeland as they disclose the overall sentiments of all the Naga diaspora. Uh, let me come to Naga migration in the US. Unlike the Indian diaspora, who trace the origin in the US since the late 1900s. Uh, some scholars opine that it's before 1900s. Now the first Nagas began their migration to the US as theological students in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Some of them have returned to their homeland after completing their studies and established their institutions. Today, some of them are no longer with us. And uh, I want to point out one of the Naga diaspora who migrated to the US in the 1960s. And he was Dr. Aryo A. Sishak, a Tangkul Naga tribe from Ukrul district, Manipur. I interviewed Dr. Sishak's niece who said, and I quote, my uncle migrated in the US in 1969 after completing his MD internal medicine from Molanat Azad Medical College, New Delhi. He got into residency in the US in general surgery. He received his MS from New York medical schools and practiced as a physician in Port Zervis, New York and Milford, Pennsylvania for 26 years and passed away in 2017 at the age of 79 years. His wife, daughter and son live in the US. My uncle was a pioneer of Naga American Foundation and everyone uh, warmly calls him as Uncle Aryo and misses him greatly today. He hosted the first Naga annual uh, meet at his residence in 1989 and served as the president of this Naga um, American Foundation from 2003 to 2007, unquote. Now it's important to highlight that the Naga diaspora in the US is the result of Nagas migrating in slow phases, including a few twice migrants, or multiple migrants. The twice migrants acquire skills and networks that facilitate their ability to integrate into the new environment in the US or to move on to seek further opportunities in other places. For instance, many Naga diaspora have migrated from homeland to India's metropolitan cities like New Delhi, Bangalore, uh, Mumbai, uh, you know, uh, Chennai, including other countries like Europe before not, they migrate to the US. In the process, they have learned how to adapt to diverse cultures, skills, and also build networks. And interestingly, Naga women have also migrated to the US as students, spouses, you know, wives, mothers, and also skilled workers and integrated in every sphere in the US. Some Naga women have earned bachelor's degree or PhD degrees. Recently, I know of my old friend uh, in the US who have already got her PhD degree during this COVID-19. Uh, and there are also other women who have earned professional course certificates in the US and they're engaging in different vocations today. So America was associated with the metaphor of a melting pot where all people, who wanted to be part of the American dream, realized their ambitions by working hard and prospering and assimilating into the American society by melting their identities and becoming American. So a uniform American identity emerged that was inclusive and then the melting pot model was replaced by the salad bowl model where all ethnic groups and people of different colors and orientations became American without losing their identities or melting, but became a part of the whole. Now this concept actually suggests that integration of different cultures combined like a salad in contrast to the traditional notion of a cultural melting pot. Now this salad bowl model seems to be applicable in the context of the Naga diaspora. And uh, let me quote Sungring Rangbung, an Anal Naga tribe from Manipur who migrated to the US in 2007, who said, and I quote, I'm a nurse in St. Luke's Hospital of Kansas City. 
and came from a poor socioeconomic background. Initially, I worked in the business uh, process outsourcing BPO call center in Bangalore and managed to gain experience and confidence. I migrated to USA after clearing TOEFL and GRE exam to do my master's degree, majoring in Christian theology. Then I switched over to nursing and I got a job in a hospital to work in emergency ward. I believe in hard work to become successful, unquote. Atsun Kamai from Rongmai Naga tribe in Manipur, who now lives in New York since 2005 onwards said, I quote, I came from a poor family. My father was bedridden and mother has no resources to provide education for my siblings and me, although they wish to send us to school. When I was nine years old, a Zesud priest and his family from Karnataka adopted me and provided me education. I was serious in studies. I graduated from St. Anne's College, Mangalore, and completed nursing degree from St. Martha's Nursing School, Bangalore. Nursing was not my first choice, but I believe that God has a plan and purpose for me. In mid-2000, USA was in short supply of healthcare workers and nurses. Hence, they were hiring nurses from all over the world and were giving green card for those who come to work in the US. God gave me an opportunity as I cleared English and CGFNS exams and I migrated to the US in 2005. Until today, my profession is a registered nurse in New York City and I became a US citizen in 2011, unquote. So both of these stories reveal that America is a country of honey flowing with milk and honey, where even people from poor economic backgrounds could excel and succeed through hard work because American society is a society of meritocracy. Now, the, my major uh, focus of uh, lecture is on Naga cultural identity. So let me come to that. The Naga cultural identity has been created through cultural dimensions that distributes to their traditions customs, conventions, and the light, which strengthens a sense of belonging. Some of them are green card holders, as, I, as we know that the nurse in New York City is already a green card holder, a, 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 permanent, green, a permanent citizen, and also a few others who are green card holders are in my study. A few of them have become American citizens, especially those who are born and brought up in the US. Automatically, those who are born in the US are US citizens. Now, this is second generation Nagas, you know, and uh, uh, some of them who are brought up, born and brought up in the US for the past 20 plus years are also serving in the US military or Navy. Now all the respondents, even those who are American citizens, including those born in their homeland said their first identity is Naga. For example, Zonathan Zinkai and Khan Loli from California said, I quote, we are Nagas from Manipur, unquote. Then they identify themselves as American. And interestingly, they were loyal to both their homeland and host country. So the cultural identity helps them to have a sense of belonging, understand their identities, passionate about their community and mingle with others in the host country. In order to reinforce their cultural identity, Naga diaspora hold a meeting come get together once in two years under the banner of Naga American Foundation. Sometimes they organize get together based on their specific tribal identity as the Tangkul Nagas, you know, uh, uh, in Texas area and the like. Sanyo Konyak from Nagaland, who is a doctor in Illinois said, and I quote, local Chicago land Nagas get together three to four times a year. And they're really cool groups. You know, when I was in Chicago also, they, one day, uh, 2013, if I remember, they said, Chicago land Nagas are gathering, you are invited as I. I mean, they're cool guys. They, they get together three to four times a year. Now they often exchange ideas, share and cook their indigenous recipes since food can bring people more closely and they speak their dialect as Naga reinforced their cultural identity. 
wear ethnic attires, and also share the burden of suffering and pain. For the Naga diaspora, food forms an indispensable part of mapping cultural ties with your homeland and asserts their culture, cultural identity. Now, this medical doctor, Konyak, uh, Samuel Konyak, uh, said, I quote, even after 16 years, I have not fully emerged myself into American food. I try to cook Naga food and get together with some Naga family just to eat Naga food and have fellowship, unquote. Ren Mary from Nagaland, who is based now in Colorado. For the interruption, uh, ma'am, could you kindly wrap up if you don't mind? Yeah. Thank you. As a Naga living in the US, I have not abandoned my ties with Nagaland and is still very much a Naga at heart. Even though I have acquired a taste for American food, hamburgers and morning cereals, my favorite food continues to be spicy chicken curry with dal and rice. Almost everyone in this study opined that cooking authentic Naga dishes is an expression of nostalgia about homeland and consider it as a way of preserving their cultural identity. So Dolly Kikon's work on Akuni, the fermented soya bean, highlights the diversities of food, ways of cooking and fishing among the Naga tribe, in which she, the Kikon argues that eating fermented food is an integral part of their culture and history. And let me wind up by saying that, you know, um, uh, Zygmunt Bauman argues that identity formation is never fixed, never final, veering between the pole of freedom and that of security. It is an intervening of continuity and discontinuity that may now hold society together. And Margaret Mead, one of the finest anthropologists, asserts that culture and identity are closely intervened since the former defines a person's identity. The person's identity helps them in making decisions and uphold certain behaviors. And uh, I just want to quote this person, uh, Tenzo Lo Thong, who's also now uh, uh, with us, uh, based in Colorado. He said, our affinity to each other as Nagas in a foreign land stems from the notion of our perceived identity as one people in spite of our differences. Back home, however, the Nagas segregate themselves into tribes and villages, oftentimes, more in tribalism and tribal favoritism. And he raised this question, can the Naga diaspora be a force for unity back home? You know, and uh, this is... Uh, uh, in the past, you know, uh, the U.S. was associated with the uh, 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 melting pot um, uh, metaphor. Uh, but then today, it, it, as I said earlier, it's a salad ball model that's absolutely fit in the context of understanding the uh, Nagas, you know, to preserve their cultural uh, identity in their homeland. And uh, lastly, uh, I must say that... Um, the Naga diaspora is not enthusiast enthusiastically pulled uh, uh, by the American dream as propounded by the sociologist Robert King Merton, because King's Merton's concept of American dream deals with success and material wealth that is possible if they work hard because the society was a meritocracy. In my observation, majority of the Naga diaspora seems to be driven by service and community relationship, which are inherited from their Naga culture. And they are also influenced by Christian ethics of life, you know, that seek a healthy work-life balance. And they're interested in inculcating their cultural values to their children. And this is not a blanket statement that I'm making, since there are a few Nagas who are being influenced by modern concepts of American dream, and but they are a minority. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Numai. That was very illuminating and very detailed. <clears throat> also, um, also, we must not forget the Naga diaspora in UK as well, where uh, your national leader, Fizo, was one of the first ones yes. to come and settle and then was followed. And we also have various kind of um, professionals and also uh, missionaries, actually. A lot of um, students of theology who have gone to seminaries, various seminaries in America, and our pastors in various churches too. We have had right. one of the pastors also give a paper yesterday. Um, so um, uh, my quick question, which we can take up later on, is also about, um, uh, as you pointed out towards the end, that there is a Christian ethics 
that is also there. And Christianity has played a major role in this diaspora that has gone outside to different countries. And, and uh, for that reason, even American Baptist mission, but also the Catholic Church. I mean, we should not forget that uh, uh, Father Abraham Lotha has studied in a seminary outside and right now he is outside. So there are, yeah. there are Nagas from different denominations who have had various reasons to go outside, either to study theology or other liberal arts subjects or scientific or uh, medical subjects, uh, technical subjects. And um, this is something one has to really emphasize that there is the American uh, society that is there, which brings together Naga and there are regional uh, get togethers. Also, there is something called Overseas Naga um, Association, the ONA, and they have been quite vocal about you know, what they feel about the Naga issue. And so it is also a tension that you have brought out between the, between the Naga in diaspora, their, their, um, uh, what they have towards their family, towards their community, and towards Naga as a nation, as, because I mean, the Naga are in different Indian states and outside too. So one has to also think in those terms that, okay, how much can they do? And this is where the anthropological segmentary system comes in, that my first responsibility is towards my family, then towards the clan, then towards the community, village. And there are Naga Christians who have actually done a lot of community projects back in their villages. So I will invite now the next, um, uh, next speaker. And um, our next speaker is um, Ajing Liu Kame. I hope I'm uh, saying the name correctly. Um, and it's very interesting. Now we come back to the diaspora in Delhi and you ended up talking about Akhuni, the fermented soya bean. And Delhi, we've recently had um, tremendous reaction to the film called Akhuni, which was about diaspora in Delhi. So that is a good connection between your paper and um, uh, uh, Dr. Kamai's paper, and I will invite you to start. Uh, your paper is called Naga Diaspora Community in Delhi, Negotiating Hierarchies of Belongingness. Thank you. Mm, thank you. And uh, for today's paper, I'll not be touching on Akuni. <laughs> uh, thank you organizers for giving me this platform to speak. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be sharing the same space with other esteemed and established uh, scholars. Oh. Why go was stop my video? Okay. You're audible, but your visual seems to have some problem. Okay, okay, uh, I'm fine with Not that. Easy. Yeah. Okay. I would like to propose a look at the Northeast diaspora community in Delhi. Why diaspora and not migrants? Why diaspora in India and not outside of the country? Do the Nagas in Delhi consider themselves as diasporas? Or are their experiences the same as that of the diasporas? If we read and listen to what's been reported or the lack of it and listen to what's been happening, there's been a lot of judgments about migrants and migrant workers. The narratives of belonging and not belonging on difference and in the recent months, the increase in the incidences of racial abuse and profiling on the Northeast people across India uh, could be seen and the questions on diaspora and who constitute the diasporic community. Of necessity, my approach is general and sweeping. The full historical and political complexities cannot be discussed here uh, today. My paper will dwell only on the Nagas living in Delhi and the narrative of hierarchies and belonging surrounding their experiences. I hope to draw out enough relevant and representative points to trace a broad pattern in the lives of the Nagas in the city. 
Diaspora by no means is a new term from the third century BCE definition for dispersal of the Jewish diaspora. It has now expanded as a theoretical frame to describe not only communities dispersed through violence as with the Jewish and the African diasporas, but also communities, cultures, individuals, and even art objects spread globally under the conditions of late capitalism. Using the model of Safran, the 10 classifications he mentioned in his concepts, theories, and challenges of diaspora, a panoptic approach, I would like to further extend or add to the classification. North is, though it may be distance-wise, not too far from the center is a world away. It is a world apart in their culture, dress, tradition, religion, food ways, work ethic, literature, cinema, art, etc. So in a way, their experiences and worldview are completely different. Coming to Delhi from their respective states, the Nagas experienced culture shock, equivalent to those people who relocate to a different country for various reasons. The main reasons for the out migration from their homeland is mainly for getting further education and for reasons of economic improvements. Complicated political, economic, and social issues were there in the region leading up to the mass out migration, uh, which I'll not be going into details in this deliberation. I look at the issues of new hierarchies of belonging, not through the literary lenses, but from the shared experiences of the people living in Delhi and NCR, especially from the young first generation to the city. When was Delhi ever homogeneous? A look at history shows that Delhi was always a multicultural city. The countless invaders in the past have put the mark on our city, making it diverse and multicultural. If we look at the uh, census, uh, especially that of uh, previous to 2001 to 2019, uh, there's a lot of uh, influx of in-migration to Delhi. But when we look at uh, prior to that, there's a lot of influx. But if we look at 2001 and 2019, uh, then we see that uh, there's a decline in the in-migration to Delhi from Northeast, as opposed to the number of people coming to Delhi from UP and Bihar. So as quoted in Times of India in an article, social scientists shift Vishwanathan pointed out that the UP and Bihar influx is so large that you cannot stereotype them, unquote. But here, stereotypes around Nortis people are being built easily for obvious reasons we all know. The ones coming from UP and Bihar, uh, they speak Hindi, uh, and their features are similar to that of the, I quote, Pakka residents, that is the Delhi Wallas. And this could also be another factor for stereotyping the not uh, stereotyping the people coming from Bihar and UP uh, difficult. The mainland Indians are placed at the top or considered to be at the top, while the people coming from south or east or west is, I quote, tolerated as long as it does not challenge the terms of the hierarchy itself. It was proven again and again that cultures of racism have frequently, if not always, scaled and ranked human diversity, often conferring the status of contingent insiders on some migrants while unloading hate and derision on other migration groups. The Nagas have been a visible minority in Delhi for quite some time and in the university, uh, campuses also, and social landscapes have been changed from the earlier times. The mainlanders from viewing the Nagas as exotic species and one of not quite knowing what to make of them have now turned to put, putting them systematically in a categorized box, which arises out of biased assumptions about them. There is so much negativity against the diaspora community in the city and ample evidence we have seen during the pandemic times. 
The incidence of violence against Northeast Indian in the country's capital reflects the racialization of the divide between the mainland and the Northeast. Mainland's fra uh, fractured relation with the Northeast can, uh, I quote, can rightly be recognized as a cultural gap, an economic gap, a psychological gap, and an emotional gap. Uh, like Toni Morrison's uh, opening in her novel, Home, uh, I quote, whose house is this? Whose night keeps a light in here? It's not mine. I dreamed another, sweeter, brighter, of fields wide as arms open for me. This house is strange. Its shadows lie. Say, tell me, why does its lock fit my key?" Unquote. So same emotions of nostalgia are felt by the Naga diasporic community here. So how often do the diasporic community here talk about home, the mountains and the fields and their experiences of being unwelcomed, the feeling of unbelongingness. The, they spoke of it very often, which is a very serious concern. So the question is, when do they stop being migrants in their own country? When do people stop asking, where do you come from? Where are you originally from? And so in response to that, who belongs here and who doesn't? Who are the outsiders and insiders? Uh, as a woman coming from the Northeast region of India, the issue of diversity and coexistence is always on my mind, both personally and professionally. What is concerning is that new hierarchies of belonging are established that replay aspects of colonial racism, but in a form that is suited to Delhi. The categorization of the Nagas as uncivilized, gullible, fun-loving, after fast money, funky hairstyles, westernized dressing, etc., in the popular culture and the news have added to this. The Delhi's ethos is imperiled amid national exercise of erasing history, constructing homogeneous identity. And so there are deep misgivings about the differences that cannot be assimilated, even by the very people who were here uh, before the North is as migrants. And George Wymiss suggests that it is through the granting or withholding of tolerance that hierarchies of belonging were produced uh, historically. And so I did a small sample of survey on how the Northeast people negotiate their everyday life in the city. And some of the following points were observed. They were uh, in constant state of crisis. Every moment they were aware of how they were looked at, thought of, always the need to justify is there in the way they talk and dress, the constant state of crisis on how to talk back or respond or react to the main, mainlander. So these are some of the things that came across from the young people. And every time a crisis occurs, the refrain, go back to where you come from, is the immediate reaction by the mainlanders or the former migrants. Uh, but reality is that there is no going back. So the question is, if there's no going back, how do we proceed? How to live here with dignity? How to assert the Nagas belongingness in their own country? And Arundhati Roy in an interview by Nick Estes uh, said, India was once a poor country with some spine, but in the past, some with some spine in the past. But by the 90s, with India aligning with the free market, changes had happened. And in the late 90s, when the right wing government came, that was, I quote her, the end of the imagination. And she further stated, there's a fear of being political now. So uh, the inference is, what is being there in the upper echelons or in the ruling party filters down to the lay people, to the ordinary people. Uh, in this instance, I would like to share an experience. Now, one day I went out to buy some fruits 
uh, this year before the lockdown happened. And I asked in English, how much was the fruit for a kilo? The local fruit seller replied in Hindi, if you don't speak in Hindi, I'll not tell the price. So such incidences are the manifestations of the reordering, the shifting, the new hierarchies, race, racism that had been filtering down over the last few years, especially. The concept of othering has a large role to play. The Northeast people suffer due to the perceived notion of the mainstream public domain, which is largely because of the differences in gender relations and structural differences in culture as well. And uh, all in different uh, degrees, all, almost all of the Northeast people here, they go through uh, this uh, experience in the city. Like, uh, allow me to read uh, my poem published in an international journal on how the diaspora feels in India. I have uh, titled it, An Indian Diaspora in India. First thing people ask me when introduced to, where do you come from? Are you Chinese? Uh, okay. Are you Japanese? Where are you originally from? poking and probing in the mainland, my mother tongue in exile, my name in exile, my looks alien, my Hindi Chinese to them, my food waste a taboo, different shades of meaning to words, Indian and an alien in India. And so I would like to end by just saying some strategies to negotiate our belongingness. Now uh, here, notice people, they live in pockets in the cities, uh, sharing similar footways, socializing, celebrating and all. But uh, Sanjeev Barwa in his um, uh, A New Politics to Race, he wrote, racially marked niches in the labor market or in settlement patterns have the danger of reinforcing racial thinking like employment in upscale hotels, restaurants, call centers. So here, uh, the thing to do is to claim our city as our own, to find work in various sectors and not just in one specific area. Try not to create not as living pockets, try, trying to branch out, to be more engaging with the mainlanders, to include more bureaucrats and politicians in the academic engagements and vice versa to bring back the narratives of diversity into the discourse. Because in the past few years, the discourse or the narrative on diversity and unity is completely seem to have lost. So even if there is a semblance of policies and programs by the government to include the community or to bring awareness, this awareness is on specific spheres of interest, trust that will serve the racial categorization or to homogenize. So more emphasis on dance and songs and festivals you know, were uh, put uh, rather than on development, literature, education, institutions, etc. And so I'm not saying organizing festivals are bad, but there should be a healthy balance in the effort to make the Nagas be understood better by the mainlanders. So what is NSA doing now, organizing talks, seminars, webinars, international conferences are the way forward. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful paper. And um, uh, Dr. Kame, uh, that was, uh, that really brought up the issues that, um, uh, that, I mean, I let me please allow me to say that Indians living in other parts of India who are physically different face when they move out from their state to another state. And this could be also for people also from Uttaranchal who may have different physical features. And uh, Tanka Subba and Jale Waters wrote a paper some time ago, which was called the Indian face, which brought up this issue of how there are certain physical features that we associate with Indianness. But at the same time, as an anthropologist, I would say that during colonial times, Risley had tried to do racial typing and he had to give up because he could get some kind of racial type issues put 
you know, that these are the physical features. But after that, he was completely confused. So this, but it is also very disconcerting that we continue to have this racial type rather than thinking about people belonging to a single nation or community or humanity as such. Also, um, what I was, you brought out uh, very nicely about where, what are these? What are people who have moved from their original state to another state? What exactly have they moved there for? Is it education? Is it jobs? And in that matter, I would like you to also kind of think about it that you touched on soft power, which is now we see several people from Northeast India working in various um, what we call um, uh, uh, in the shops, in the hotels. Uh, uh, what is it called? There's some there's a particular term for it, you know, um, hospitality industry. And this has been in economics known as soft power, that you spread yourself in every sector. Now, what has been the attraction is the educated, English speaking, very smart and honest. So these kind of um, uh, uh, characteristics that are attached to certain level. Then we also have others who are teaching in colleges, in university, those who are in central services. So one has to also look at, I mean, there is already a hierarchy in the kind of positions. Um, Naga from, um, uh, from Nagaland, Manipur, Assam are occupying in different parts of India. And how does that relate to their position? Is the Naga who is, like you said, that it didn't matter that you are a college lecturer or a professor, but you were treated as if, you know, speaking Hindi is the main thing. And that is a kind of Hindi nationalism which is being imposed on everyone. Now, whether it is only towards you or it could have been towards anyone else who may or may not have the physical features of the vendor. So that is also to see, but also because when one is being excluded and being othered, then one has to think that is it because of the way I look, the way I speak, or is it some kind of othering taking place towards everyone? And you pointed that out, that it is happening with also people who come from South Indian states, that they are othered, but those from the North Indian Hindi speaking belt are seen as their own. If you see that in Maharashtra also, this kind of discrimination. And this, this is something we can take up later on, that, that what are the anxieties that make people create these boundaries. Okay, now uh, let's go on to the next um, next paper. Sorry, um, you're already there. Um, I hope I'm uh, saying your name correctly, Shim, Shimresa. Shim, Shimresa Jahan now, uh, he's going to talk about functions of globalization, social stratification, in the Tankul Nagas. Um, please start your paper. You have 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, we will intervene. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay, for the time. Uh, I also want to thank NSA for this wonderful opportunity. My paper titled Functions of Globalization, Social Stratification in the Tankul Nagas. It is a work in progress. Uh, it is an attempt to understand the social structure of the Dankul Naga society. So in the end, I look forward to your insightful observations, comments, and also questions, which will be very helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> technological advancement with its uh, concomitant economic and political interests has made the world smaller. In the process, the capitalists and its corporate arms have permeated into almost every aspect of our lives. The Naka society, though they live in, most of them live in villages, but they are not free from the impact of these uh, multinational corporations. For instance, the remittance economy occurring from the MNCs in most of the villages are clearly visible. The impact has positive as well as negative dimensions. However, this study does not 
seek to clarify whether the consequences are desirable or not. Rather, it looks at what actually transpired in the social process, specifically what social structure has taken shape in the process because of globalization. The objective of this paper, therefore, is to analyze social stratification as one of the consequences of globalization. The study premises on the assumption that colonialism has similar bearings with globalization in Northeast India because both of these uh, events and processes concerns with trade and making the most out of the, out of the cheap labor available. This has changed the social structure of the society in many ways. Hence, uh, the study starts with the historical inquiry of a specific social institution of the Tangkul Naga society, namely uh, Maran Kasa. In the colonial parlance, it is known as Feast of Merit. It will also look into the uh, case of how land relations are being developed in the society. Though social stratification exists in the Tangkul Naga society, even before the colonial period, traditional structures were abolished and new forms of social structures were institutionalized by the colonialists using education, new flow of capital, and religious ideas, among others. So one of the assertions this study made is this social process embedded in the governmentality invigorated the brooding space of inequality. Moreover, in the post-colonial period, mainly because of education, relative mobility, and the employment opportunities, gender relation began to change with women getting educated and contributing to society's progress. They have begun to question the parochial aspects of traditional beliefs in the patriarchal setup. At the same time, they also reflect at some of the virtues of tradition where women are allowed to take leadership positions. In another case, the notion of elite has also begun to change. With more and more people getting into government jobs, many engaging themselves as contractors, politicians, among others, the metamorphosis of leadership can be seen. For instance, uh, from traditional notion of authority to new forms of wealth and power, directing the poles of leadership. So theoretically, one can see a uh, weaponian form of social stratification more prominent in the Naga society than the Marxist form of social stratification. I won't uh, delve into that. Of course, suppositions, my suppositions could be debate, uh, could be highly debatable for others. However, I leave that for the discussion part, if I may. Coming to the definition of uh, globalization and social stratification. Globalization connotes different things to different people. To some, it represents a brave new world with no barriers, while to others, it spells doom and destruction. Uh, borrowing the word of C. Rankarajan, the term globalization, it broadly means integration of economies and societies through cross-country flow of information, ideas, technologies, goods, services, capital, finance, and the people. In a narrower sense, David Held defined it as interconnected global order marked by intense pattern of exchange, as well as clear patterns of power, hierarchy, and uneven, unevenness. Simply put, uh, for the sake of this study, globalization is a process of integration at the global level. At the same time, it has unintended consequence of disintegration. Social stratification uh, is layering of unequal social groups in the society, like class, status, gender, among others. Now, coming to the main discussion of the paper, that is how globalization engendered social stratification in the Tangkul Nagas. The function of globalization is creating social hierarchy in the Tangkul Nagas. It is analyzed from two perspectives. First, the ideological consequences permitted through the values and belief system of the society. And secondly, through the material perspective, that is land relation. The Tangkul Nagas constitute one of the many tribes of Manipur. According to one Tangkul scholar, Shimre, in his work on ecology and economy of the Tangkul Nagas, the community is considered to be egalitarian in many respects. 
many a time they also compete with the caste society, which is clearly stratified into a hierarchy. Another scholar, Simon, points out that even the rather unique differentiation by clan distinctions among the Nagas is again united by clan exogamy, unlike the Quatra system of marriage in most of the caste stratified society. But social stratification in terms of long known class cleavage among the Nagas is less explored, yet it has become more prominent in the post-colonial period, globalization being one of the main factors. Ideological impact is analyzed by interrogating the institution of Maran Kasa, colonially known as Feast of Merit. This uh, age old practice could be seen in some part, some of the Naga society until 1962 in Nagaland. Whereas in the Tangkul society, this practice has been banned since uh, maybe around 1940s. Maran Kasa among the Tangkul Nagas includes social differentiations that socially and psychologically segregates those who are able to hold the feast of merit from the rest. The feast includes hosting a meal for the entire villages, distributing free rice, rice beers, and lots of meat, and erecting white wooden poles, locally known as tarung. Each feast in the series of this gave the host different privileges from wearing distinctive motifs on traditional attires to embellishing the house with carvings, the privilege to wear feathers on the, of the hornbill bird, etc. So in the Dankul Naga society, during the pre-Christian era, those who are able to hold such kind of feast are even distinguished by a shipolet known as Kalaknau, which in free translation, it means people in the higher hierarchy. The institution of Marangasa is known to create a class of its own within the village. However, the distinction does not create class antagonism. Rather, Simon, uh, Danku scholar Simon notes that the difference in the class is more in respect of sustaining the communitarian feeling. By, hold, by holding the feast, according to Shimre, one, scholar, one Danku scholar in his work, Origin and Culture of Nagas, sharing of wealth is restored. Uh, in 2018, a reporter in the Indian Express noted uh, that a restaurant in Melbourne named Feast of Merit has been inspired by the Naga tradition of sharing of wealth, where the profit of the restaurant went into supporting local entrepreneurs. The colonialists, on the other hand, could not capture such essence of the feast, but so it so the practice as a system that perpetuates inequality and is prone to a life given to voluptuous indulgence that their Protestant Christianity does not encourage. So traditional institutions like Maran Kasa, along with many others were banned. Now in the process of banning the traditional beliefs and practices, two groups with different inclinations to varying philosophies emerged in the Tangkul Naga society. One, pro-Christian, and the other anti-Christian. The anti-Christians were mostly led by traditional leaders as they feel obligated to protect their tradition. Consequently, the pro-Christians were educated and reaped its benefits much earlier than the traditionalists. Ultimately, leadership began to change. New form of elite emerges from the educated class, including politicians. Some scholars like uh, Ramyo Simon attribute this process as the emerging point of middle class in the tribes. Now we can see how social stratification in terms of leadership has taken a turn in its flow. Those who were leaders in olden days are now slowly being replaced by other forms of hierarchy. In case of land, it was considered as one of the main determinants of wealth along with cattle among the Dankul Nagas. Ancestral land could only be inherited by male members of the family. Accordingly, patriarchy is strengthened with its hold on ownership of land based on male primogeniture. However, with the permeance of new modes of capital, notion of ownership has begun to change. That is, 
wealth and status are increasingly achieved from different walks of life by both men and women of the Tangku Naga Society. This new form of ownership invigorated by globalization enables one to question the dogmatic view of customary practice, even on the law of inheritance that can weigh on gender relations of the society. In conclusion, uh, I have made few observations. They are, uh, whether we like it or not, it has become a matter of fact that because of globalization, social stratification has become more pronounced in the Tanku Naga society. The psychological strata have found articulations in the form of intellectual inquiry, including gender relations. Leadership role is becoming more complex. It is more contested from the uh, rational legal perspective. The traditional form of leadership is increasingly being replaced by uh, alternative choices defined by new forms of wealth, power, and status in the society. Therefore, in order to clearly understand the social structure of the Dangu Nagas, there is a need to inquire on how the social and cultural history of the Naga society interacts with new forms of global development. Thank you. Thank you for finishing dot on time. That was very good. Um, immediate observation. Um, it's very interesting that you talk about, um, one thing that came to my mind was, why was it that Feast of Merit was banned in 1940s? And you can answer after the next question, next paper, uh, you can think about it. And also, um, you know, hierarchy, uh, uh, the whole idea that all Naga communities are egalitarian, uh, since, you know, the knowledge that we derive are from the old monographs, what has been written in colonial times and what is being written now, is also that, yes, there was a difference between hierarchy, whether it was ritual hierarchy, political hierarchy, or all these two gained together by those who had uh, more land and thus had more production of grain and had animals and were able to feast the village and then reach a certain status. So what it creates is a certain kind of patronage. Now these people would also be helping others who were poor by probably giving land to them to cultivate, but also giving shelter to anyone who is coming from another community or another village. So you have this patronage system, which we see in certain communities, not every community, uh, Naga community. And what happens with that when it changes, when your whole idea of feast of merit has now changed and what you are investing it and getting the prestige from is through education and other achievements. So you have the, the wealth and the warrior and the courage that, is, that are the old values that you were saying that the values are changing. Now, what are, what are the new things that people are respecting? Is it educational achievement? Is it achievement is business? And how people are redistributing that wealth? Are they infusing like um, uh, Professor Newmai talked about? Is there some kind of putting back into the community in certain way? Is something being done for the welfare of the clan or the village or the community? So these are the things we need to think about. What are the prestige items now and how it is being done? And the wealth, as it was seen earlier, is the wealth in educational achievement, in other achievements, and how that is related to community. Is the, is the idea of doing things for the community, has it taken a backseat? Is it become more individualistic and you uh, you invoked Weber? And you know, what exactly is happening? Is it more individualization? So um, so these are, these are very interesting points and we will come back because this whole idea of change that is taking place, even the movement out migration is also part of it. It becomes an achievement to be able to go outside, maybe, maybe outside the country. So uh, we'll come back and I would, I would encourage the audience to please think about questions to put to the presenters. And if you could write the questions in the chat or, or if, you, uh, if you can't, don't have access to the chat, you can tell us you know, the question, you can read them out, all right? I will now invite the last speaker.
And um, is she here? She's there. Uh, the, yes, she's there. Yeah. Uh, the last she's speaker there. is um, Nugutoli Sul, and uh, she's going to talk about the invisible cloak of cultural appropriation among the millennial Naga. That's very interesting, actually. It's coming to what exactly are the Nagas doing, especially the millennial, all those who were born from the 1990s onwards. OK, uh, I shall hand over. Um, I can't see her, so. Here, uh, she's visible from here. She's okay. there. Yeah. All right, so I shall mute myself. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is Chairperson, the session organizer, and uh, my fellow speaker and participants. My paper is titled The Invisible Clock of Cultural Appropriation Among the Millennial Naga. Cultural appropriation, it is basically defined as the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, etc., of one people or society by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. According to Sabina Gyado, a filmmaker, cultural appropriation is taking someone's cultural artifacts without the consent and profiting from it, whether that's in actual money, fame, or some other tangible, intangible benefit. Cultural appropriation could also mean purchasing a piece of jewelry or clothing that may have cultural significance to that culture, but without acknowledging that fact, one simply uses it as a fashion statement. Another definition of cultural appropriation is taking from a culture that is not one's own of intellectual property, cultural expressions or artifacts, history and ways of knowledge. Simply put, cultural appropriation is the illegal, unfair or unjust usage of or taking of something that belongs to someone else. Cultural appropriation is often misunderstood with cultural appreciation, cultural exchange. What we take to be cultural appreciation or cultural exchange can unintentionally turn out to be appropriation if we are not cautious. It is important for us, therefore, to understand what cultural appreciation and cultural exchange is. Cultural appreciation is once when someone seeks to understand and learn about another culture in an effort to broaden their perspective and connect with others cross-culturally. It involves respect and value, and cultural exchange is a mutual sharing of cultures by individuals or groups. In the context of Nagaland, we practice what we call unity in diversity. We have 16 recognized tribes, and each tribe has a distinct culture and tradition. Among the rich tangible cultural heritage that each Naga tribe possess, I would like to focus on the traditional clothes and ornaments of the Nagas, which holds great cultural significance. These are cultural identity markers for each tribe and have been passed on from one generation to the other. With the passage of time, the raw materials might have gone undergone great change, but the designs and the colors have remained the same. The reason being each holding cultural significance and a story telling about that particular community. To an outsider, all the Naga tribes may look the same and they may not be in a position to differentiate one tribe to the other, but being a Naga, it is always easy for us to differentiate between each other based on our cultural identity marker. Visually, one important cultural identity marker that makes one instantly understand the community of a person is from what traditional clothes he or she is wearing. When we look back at our history, we find that the Nagas were exposed to various encounters with outsiders like the British, the American Baptist missionaries, the Indians, and each left their indelible mark on our culture. But keeping that aside, when we observe the changes that are occurring in the Naga society at present, our mindset and attitude seems to be going far away from what our forefathers used to believe and practice. Believing that culture can never remain static, it is apparent that change will surely occur in one way or the other. And when we observe the generations of Nagas, uh, we see that people in the late 50s and 60s are somehow in touch with the, our history and rooted in our culture. But when we take the case of the millennial and centennial, that is those born after 1980s, we find some imbalance in the way we perceive our culture. On, on one hand, the fascination for foreign culture, the most popular among the millennials and centennial being the K-pop, and Korean culture is scary. On the other hand, when we observe the back to roots, roots trend on popular social media platform, 
being used by the millennial and centennial Naga, at first look one feel great appreciation and pride, but on a closer look, it is also scary to see how for aesthetic appeal, many of them, including people holding position of significance are mixing up the cultural materials taken from different tribes and digging themselves up without any acknowledgement or without understanding the significance. I often find myself very disturbed when I see mix and match of cultural materials belonging to different Naga tribes being used without giving any acknowledgement and being simply stacked with this Naga, that Naga, which would mean that the entire ensemble is of a particular tribe in the eyes of the ignorant audience. I would like to share certain encounters I have had which led me to take interest in this topic. A well-known group of folk musicians whom I, I, I will not be naming, who often deck themselves with cultural materials from various Naga community, uh, I approached them and asked them as to why a certain cultural material was being used by simply changing the color, but without any acknowledgement to the tribe to which it originally belonged. To this, there ensued a long tirade which had no significant outcome. Another instance was a mobile cover company advertising customized mobile, co mobile cover design by showcasing a mobile cover with a Sumi women's shawl on their Instagram page. I was very offended and so I approached them and inquired as to how they came to be in possession of the design of the shawl and whether they got permission to use it as a mobile cover as this shawl was not meant to be used for such purpose. To this, they replied that the customer had requested for the same but if it was conflicting with the original design, they were ready to take it down. I replied saying that they should take it down as these cultural materials were identity and as such, it, it cannot be altered as one pleases or used on any product for the sake of aesthetic appeal without permission. And so they took it down from the Instagram page. When we observed the millennial and centennial Naga trending on social media, wearing traditional clothes, one common cultural material that seems to be used by all the women irrespective of the age or tribe is the tassel earrings. It is apparently originally used by the Sumi, Lota and Sangtam tribe, but at present it is used by all the tribes. Now the question is where we do we draw the line? This popularity is further strengthened by some Naga designers labeling this earring as indigenous earring, tribal flower earrings, and then reproducing the exact replica of the original earrings in various colors. We also see many young women wearing men's shawl and then taking it as being uh, going back to the roots. We also see some pages on Instagram promoting Naga indigenous textiles and crafts, but the caption they use to advertise such products are merely Naga men's shawl, Naga women's mekala. Naga is not a single entity, and as such, there is no such thing as a Naga men's shawl or a Naga women's mekala. They produce mekala of different Naga tribes as well as shawls of different Naga tribes and put it up on sale in, the, in this manner. Now, my question is, does the tribe to which that particular mekala or shawl belong have any idea about what is going on? Is the designer or the person behind such pages aware that the cultural significance of each cultural material item that he or she is putting up on sale? And these are original designs that are being put up in that manner. Another question I want to raise here is, as much as it is important for us, the millennial, as well as the centennial to go back to our roots with the most popular trend being to wearing our traditional clothes with pride, isn't it is also important for us to at least differentiate between what men can wear and what women are supposed to wear, get at least basic knowledge about the piece of traditional attire or ornament that one is putting on. We also have instances of rice brand using the image of a women in semi-traditional attire, some noodle company using the image of kids adorned in Naga tribes traditional attire. I would also like to bring up um, knowledge appropriation. We have many non-Nagas contributing richly to the various aspects of our culture, especially in the field of research and documentation. But on the other hand, we also have some non-Nagas publishing books on the Nagas without doing any proper research. To enunciate this point, I, I want to bring up two books. In the process of studying books on cultural heritage, which is my PhD topic, I have been trying my best to collect and read books on the Naga culture and heritage, irrespective of the author. In the process, I came across these two books, which were purchased by the Department of Art and Culture Government of Nagaland, sponsored by Rajara Mohan Roy Library Foundation to be distributed to the rural and urban area libraries across Nagaland. What struck me first was the cover page of these two books which had the same picture. 
And the irony was the authors were different. Secondly, there was no information about the authors. And thirdly, no photo credit is given in both the books. As I went through these books, I was shocked at the quality of writing as well as the content. In the book, Life of the Naga Tribe and the Clan Traditions, the author named Mohan Kumar has dedicated one full chapter to Naga Kingdom pages 19 to 37. And what do we get here? He talks about Naga race of Mahabharata period, which has nothing to do with us. The whole Pandava Kaurava story is written, and next chapter goes on to conflict in Northeast India, which has nothing to do about Naga culture. The whole book is full of wrong information and pick and choose type of information. Similar is the next book called Culture of Naga, uh, of Naga People by Hemraj Singh. Leaving aside all the jumbled up story, in page 100, at the end of the page, he forgot to remove an information in the inner bracket, which says, browse through our Nagaland two packages. Under tradition and culture, he writes about the state of Mizoram, Meghalaya, and this is nothing about the relationship between Nagaland and these two states, but just general information about where Mizoram is, what population it has, and the same goes with Meghalaya. And again, he mentions about the famous waterfalls of Meghalaya. These are just two, but how many are out there? And also why are government, before purchasing such books, uh, why our government is not checking on the contents of the book be uh, before making such a purchase? We have many books written by our Naga and many young researchers are looking for funding to get their research works published. So why not invest on those? The practice cited above are just few among many that are filling up the social media platforms. Mm. And here I would like to state that except for the knowledge appropriation, the intent may not be of appropriation and it may be to show appreciation, support, as well as the feeling of acceptance and unity. But such act without deep rooted understanding of a particular culture may have long term effects. Well, most of the millionaire Naga may or may not have the knowledge about the historical significance behind each cultural material of one's own tribe. The culture of mix and match wherein without really understanding the cultural significance of a particular cultural material of a particular tribe. This aesthetic appeal has surpassed the need to maintain a boundary line between what is acceptable and what is not. This train has been followed by the Centennial Naga. This is a dangerous trend as, as this practice at present may or may not be a deliberate appropriation, but it may become a breeding ground for tomorrow's confusion about certain aspects of our cultural heritage, especially traditional clothes and ornaments. That is, a day may come when we would not know which culture belong to which tribe. Now, how do we tackle this issue? I have used the term invisible clock of cultural appropriation in my title. This in assuming that those who are practicing appropriation does not have the knowledge about such a thing as appropriation being a crime. It is possible for all Naga tribes to get GI tag or copyright for all the cultural property and intellectual property. And even if that is done, it will be a long process. Therefore, one has to realize that each tribe has their own tribal bodies. For example, for the Simi, we have the Simi Hoho, the apex body and the custodian of the Simi tribe. Then we have the Simi Literature Board who looks after the preservation of the Simi language and oral tradition. And then the Simi Toti Muhoho who are the caretaker of the Simi traditional clothes and ornaments along with their other responsibilities. And I'm sure it will be the same with other Naga tribes too. Therefore, if one need to use a cultural material for especially for commercial purpose, one should at least take permission from such for a start and not just do as one like as such acts are harmful. Secondly, we have to develop the practice of cultural appreciation. Ethical posting on social media also needs to be practiced. We have to be careful about what we post, especially when donning cultural materials in this age and time as we have become global people. And so everything we, becomes, uh, everything we post becomes documented. Thirdly, we need to set up certification bodies of each tribe so that random research and random writings on Nagas do not happen not only among the Nagas, but also the non-Nagas. This should be done so that people outside do not believe the half back information spread by so-called experts on the Naga culture. And this knowledge appropriation is stopped. To cite an example of similar practice being practiced by other indigenous people, I would like to cite an instance of my husband's experience. When my husband submitted a PhD research proposal to the University of Auckland, New Zealand, to undertake research on Maori people in the Department of Applied Humanities, Cultural Anthropology, he was referred to Ethics Committee and also to the Maori Studies Department of the University. The Maori Studies Department asked him to take up some Maori study subject and also spend a year in Maori Marae, which is similar to the 
Nagamoru prior to taking up the coursework and research. This was despite him living in New Zealand for five years and after doing a reference study on Maori people on his Enfield dissertation. So we see that such controlled environment of knowledge dissemination enables a non-Maori to properly understand and develop a respect as well as get a thorough understanding of the culture and tradition before embarking on researching on them. If we can adopt similar practice, then it will go a long way in not only proper analytical documentation of various aspects of our culture and tradition, but also develop value system and respect for our culture. In, in conclusion, I would like to reiterate that the subject I have brought up this evening may seem insignificant at the moment, but understanding that our history is based on oral traditions without proper documentation and with our memory keepers passing away as the years go by, if each Naga does not take a stand and bridge the gap by practicing cultural appreciation with or without knowing it, the practice of cultural appropriation will become rampant and this will pose a danger for each Naga tribe as we will be losing our cultural markers and this time we would have no one to blame it on except ourselves and our ignorance. Thank you. Thank you very much for finishing on time and very interesting paper in the first few sessions we actually had um, the whole um, paper on geographical area indication and the question of the muffler worn by the Prime Minister Modi and how it was being manufactured in UP but it actually it belongs to Manipur and it's a cloth which is used by um, different communities there, There's their overlapping heritage. And also um, your question of mismatch. Now, one thing that really comes into my mind and those who are in Delhi, if when the museums reopen, please do go and see the, the Northeast Tribal Gallery and National Museum in Delhi, in Janpat. You will see the mismatch there. If I had time, I would show you the slides. There is a mixing of men and women's clothing from different communities on the three mannequins that are exhibited there. And it, they have been there for last 20 years. And it is a kind of apathy. I wouldn't say it's apathy towards the community, but it's a general apathy we see in some of the Indian institutions where they are not bothered to even go to Manipur house or Nagaland house, which are just two kilometers away from the institution to actually consult as to how to how to display the ornaments, the, the collection. And also uh, you brought up a very important point about the way textbooks are bought by libraries and even the educational institutions and, and how nobody checks the content. And there is an increasing trend in subcontracting textbooks to people, to authors who are not qualified and who just cut and paste information. And I have myself come across a class seven textbook in, in a Nagaland school, which had unless um, a very badly written article on Nagaland state. And I think it has been removed now, but this was about 15 years ago that I had seen and I was taken aback. Also this thing about um, one question that it brings up is that what is appropriation and what is not? what is allowed and what is not, and who decides what one can use or not. And perhaps either it has to be a state strategy or a community strategy to come up with certain boundaries as to how certain ornaments or clothing or symbols which are specific to a community can be used in what context. And this is, this is a worldwide problem. So uh, we have had cases about the Maasai uh, people from Kenya who had actually put a petition to a very um, well-known international company. And they said, if you want to use our symbols, then you have to give a part of the profit to the community for community development. So perhaps something like this could come up that anyone who wants to use it for business purposes has to actually contribute towards community development. It's just a suggestion. These things take um, a, a long time to come through. Um, also, um, about innovation and why is it that just uh, making the ornaments in a different color is considered something new. 
So this is something we need to actually think that, that those designers who are designing, what are the boundaries of designing? I do know some entrepreneurs who are doing very well and they're very careful. They're very careful about designs, that they are not going into the designs which have deep symbolic meaning for the communities. And they're looking, they're turning, they're changing the design and using the design that are in the general sphere. So those kind of um, precautions have to be taken. And of course, it is for the communities to decide what people are allowed to copy and not. So that is a thought that is there. And I think it'll be scholars like you who would bring in these kind of issues onto the platform and for this, uh, various departments and people to decide. Now, let me open the um, floor. And uh, because we uh, we are behind schedule, we have been uh, graciously uh, given some extra time for question and answers. And I would like um, audience to chip in um, and ask any questions. I see um, Mr. Vati Longchar was making some comments. And would he like to... Um, uh, ask any question? Uh, should I read it out? Yeah, you can what read it out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, this is to Professor Ajailu uh, from Wati Launcher. Uh, thanks for the informative presentation. What about Nagas, example, Myanmar Nagas, who left for US due to exploitation in Myanmar, or women who have been trafficked from co for commercial sex? Uh, they are subjected to many kinds of exploitations and many lives as slaves. Um, many people wish to return to their homeland due to racial and exploitation. Uh, your comments, please. And should I move to the next? It's by the same person uh, to uh, Achinlu. Uh, thanks, Achinlu, for your scholarly presentation. Sadly, Cause ridden Indian society still look upon tribals as locals. It is sad to see that Northeast India young boys and girls migrated to Indian cities for meager wages. Our government have failed to create jobs for young people. Of course, it's more of a comment than question, but uh, you can respond based on the comments made. And over to you, uh, Dr. Viba, and you can allot the time as yeah, um, uh, so Professor Numai, would you like yeah. to um, yeah, sure. answer uh, Let me start with uh, Myanmar Nagas. Uh, I did not include in my study since I, uh, no, I have not come uh, across any one of them personally. But when I lived in the Midwest uh, in 2013 and 14 in the University of Iowa, uh, in Des Moines area near Chicago and also in other parts of Illinois, there are uh, many Myanmaris there and uh, also they survive on food stamp and some of them are uh, working in the airports, working in the unorganized sectors, you know, and uh, uh, they seem to be quite comfortable, the, the Myanmar refugees in the US, but let me clearly say that I have not acro come across any one of them and therefore I didn't uh, have the opportunity to include in my study. I would have loved to do that though. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one is about women, uh, sex uh, trafficked women who are uh, exploited and face uh, racial discrimination overseas. Now, let me tell you that I have been working on this uh, issue uh, of women trafficking for 12 years now. And the first um, project which I did under UGC and the next project which I completed last year under ICCSR reveals the hundreds and hundreds of girls, especially Naga girls from Manipur and also children, uh, young boys and girls from Nagaland uh, have been trafficked to different parts of India and overseas. Now coming to overseas, in my first project under UGC, I found that a whole lot of Naga girls uh, were trafficked to Malaysia and Singapore. Now I interviewed one of this girl who was repatriated to India and she have mentioned that in 2018, sorry, 2008, 
uh, she said uh, that during that time 150 girls are now are that time confined in Singapore and Malaysia but there is no chance of coming back I said why now the response is quite disturbing because she said that even her own passport is seized by the PIM is uh, so there is it, without a passport is impossible for them to ever come back they can't even contact their family members obviously because they're not uh, handed over their wages by the pin and uh, interesting that they were made to speak english they were taught a basic etiquette how to use fork knife and spoon to entertain the foreign client in the international flesh market Okay. Now, in uh, my recent study, uh, I found interestingly, I even went to Myanmar last year for field work. Uh, I found that this uh, Naga girls, particularly, were taken from Northeast, particularly uh, Moray, the international uh, trade town of, Mia, uh, of Manipur, to um, Tamu and then to Yangon, and uh, prepared a false passport of Myanmar. So they're no longer a citizen of India. Uh, they are a citizen of Myanmar. And then from there, from Myanmar, Yangon, they are trafficked to Dubai. I, when I interviewed this um, CID, uh, Crime Investigation Bureau, the IPS officer in Guwahati, he said that the government of Assam sent him to Dubai to see uh, the situation of traffic girls from the Northeast. And she, he said that the underbelly of Dubai is sex work and nightclub. That is the underbelly of Dubai. And there are a whole hundreds and thousands of girls from the Northeast. Uh, and that obviously includes the Naga girls from the hill districts of Manipur. Uh, and there is, I mean, it is evident that they are there, they exploited uh, 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 racially, they exploited sexually, racially in the sense that, you know, these girls are uh, considered as any other Asian girls, right? Because of their physical feature. But as I said earlier, they are not paid, they, they cannot come back because of the very fact that they don't have a passport. Uh, to buy even tickets. And even if they try to escape, I mean, it's a mafia that operates. Like um, what the finest social scientist, uh, Manuel Castell says, the networks and natwas, uh, there is no EP center to track down the spins. So even if the Naga girls wants to come back to their homeland, there is no chance because there is no EP center for the CBI, uh, for the crime investigation police officers to track down. You know, so it is a very uh, difficult uh, situation. I mean, it is extremely dangerous and difficult for them to even think of coming out. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is their way. The only thing for us is to create a situation, push the policy makers, influence the policy makers uh, to look into this issue issue as a very serious issue. When I met the Chief Minister of Manipur in 2007 in the month of May, I impressed upon him very strongly for 20 long minutes that he needs to form an anti-trafficking unit in Manipur, you know, and also anti-trafficking uh, committee. And he did form that anti-trafficking unit. But in Nagaland, I mean, things are quite different in the sense that uh, there is a red light unofficial red light area in Dimapur and girls are traffic, even children are traffic. Uh, the, the Nagaland children are traffic even to Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. I remember in 2009, my own University of Hyderabad research scholars from Nagaland and Manipur have gathered together to rescue these girls and boys from Nagaland and send them back to Nagaland. You know, but there is no chance for us to even uh, track down the pimps and the traffickers. That is the major problem. And to bring them back is uh, almost impossible from a foreign land. So the only solution for me is to influence the policy makers, number one. And number two is to create awareness among the parents, village peoples, and families as well. Uh, 
to be very careful and not to send out their children just for job, lucrative job, uh, which comes in a deceive uh, manner and also for free educational opportunities. You know, the offers are so, so seductive that poor parents from the hills gets uh, deceived very easily. And we need to create a system to control this menace at the ground level. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> we are, we are, we are uh, slightly behind schedule. So, but this was, um, it's actually uh, very disconcerting to hear what you said just now. Um, and I just hope that the policies and things are, uh, are in place so that we can actually bring back uh, these girls and children. Yeah, in uh, yeah. 2018, some of the girls who work in a Thai Tantra spa in the city of Hyderabad were- um, We have similar Thai cases in Delhi also in Jaipur. Yeah. yeah. I personally have to rescue them with the help um, of the police and send them back. His, uh, I think uh, uh, this is this is where I will bring in um, uh, our next speaker and ask her to also um, sort of comment. Um, uh, Dr. Sorry, <laughs> Dr. Kame, uh, you talked about migration and diaspora in Delhi and hierarchy. I was just wondering if you could uh, also reflect on the comment uh, by um, Mr. Vati Longchar. And also, uh, I wanted to say, um, if you could also comment, I mean, this is for uh, both of you, actually, uh, Professor Nyumai and Kamai, about Dolly Kekon and Bengt Carlson's book, Leaving the Land, which also talks about the difference between English speaking and Hindi speaking migrants, and how they are treated differently. And how Again, the same thing happens that the wages are not given and they are unable to go back. Sometimes they have borrowed a lot of money to come out of the land so to be able to help the family. And this is the distinction between different levels, hierarchies, even among the migrants. And whether um, uh, Kame, uh, she could actually uh, talk about that. Uh, we are trying to give five minutes to all the speakers to reflect on questions. So I would suggest that if you other audience have any questions to type them in the chat. Is she there, Kame? Uh, yes, I'm yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Wati, for putting in the uh, comment or a statement also. Uh, thank you for that. It's really sad uh, indeed that our own governments and uh, our people who are in power, they are not able to uh, provide or look after the people. And also it is uh, the duty of the people also to um, take the uh, uh, leaders or the politicians accountable for it. But uh, I would suggest NSA can take up the issue of uh, this uh, because it's a completely new um, new topic uh, and we can have a good webinar <laughs> on it again and uh, and uh, there are so many things uh, to uh, unravel uh, regarding the caste system and how the others look at us and the othering by the uh, mainlanders and putting us or clapping us together into uh, another uh, into the car system even though we are not in it and uh, so uh, i'm uh, i look forward to thank you for uh, uh, mentioning this living the land uh, book i have not uh, read it yet i intend to read it thank you viva ma'am uh, and, and about the uh, hierarchies here, uh, it comes to my mind uh, regarding the uh, migrants who speak English and Hindi. When I first came to uh, Delhi, I remember the uh, lay people or the ordinary citizens, uh, they, uh, the way they respond uh, to uh, me uh, was different uh, whenever I speak in English, like uh, they, uh, 
uh, they respond to it. They wanted to interact. Uh, they uh, are forthcoming. Uh, but the recent trends, uh, we all know what the government now is pushing uh, for uh, whatever they are. Uh, and so the changes in the uh, uh, response or reaction from the lay people have uh, this drastic radical change. Uh, and so uh, the kind of uh, response that I used to get from people when we talk in English is no longer there. And the young people uh, I have uh, talked to in Delhi also, for them, the experiences are uh, the same. And so here uh, they, uh, and also uh, there are so many layers of hierarchies, uh, but unlike the hierarchies uh, among the migrants themselves that's uh, there in uh, America. Uh, fortunately for us uh, in Delhi, it's not there because uh, in America, the uh, migrants who came there uh, prior to the later migrants who came, they uh, think of themselves higher than the later migrants who uh, came there. But in Delhi, uh, when, uh, yeah, migrants or diaspora, I'm interusing the term. And so uh, there seems to be no hierarchies as such, uh, as of now, and which is a very good thing. Uh, and so uh, uh, in order not to make those kind of hierarchies, there need to be give and take uh, within the uh, different communities that comes from the Northeast. And uh, we can all act as bridges now uh, for the community to uh, have communication open to each other. And so that's one thing I would like to uh, suggest. Thank you so much. And, and I, can, I can hear the rice being cooked in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Which is okay. Um, I would like, uh, there's a, uh, would you like to read the question from uh, Aheli Coco? Uh, sure. Just a second. I'll first get one round of all the speakers and then we can come back to you, um, Professor Numai. No, no, um, I'm done. I think it's okay because time is running out. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Koko, would you okay. like to read out yeah. uh, from uh, yeah. Mad Yes, yes. Uh, this is to uh, Ngatoli from Moitra. Um Ngatoli, thank you for your presentation. I wonder how you theorize change and new networks that sentinels and millennials become part of and does the mixing and matching as an inevitable process. Uh, can there be a limit set today on authenticity without blocking these networks available to people today to exercise expression. Thank you, over to you. Ha. Please unmute yourself, Nutuli. Ah, yes, you're done. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, during the my presentation, I could not talk about the encounters I had during my field work. During, uh, regarding the, the first question about the theory, uh, how I theorize change and new networks, the centennial and millennial become part of, and thus the mixing and matching is an inevitable process. Um, every culture is, culture is not static, so change is bound to happen. And for the centennial and the millennial Naga, we have undergone a lot of change from 80s onwards. We have been exposed to new technologies. We have been exposed to new ways of life. We have gone out of our homes to maybe to get education for jobs and all those things. So change is a uh, change was bound to take place. But the problem that I uh, I am noticing now in our culture is that the young people or uh, the millennial and the centennial are not taking an effort to really understand about our culture. They're not taking interest to learn about it. And instead uh, they are going in another direction where they want to, for aesthetic appeal, not because of the cultural significance of a particular material that they are putting on, but uh, for aesthetic appeal, they put on, they put on this culture, they are taking on this culture of mixing and matching where, for example, you ask anybody mixing a cultural material from 
one, uh, two, three tribes together, and you ask that particular person whether he or she knows what is the significance of the material that he or she is putting on. I'm sure the answer will be no. When I went for my field work, most of the people living in rural areas, especially the old people, they say that young people, they don't even want to speak their own language. So we are at that stage. And in such a scenario, this kind of mixing and matching culture is a dangerous trend. And unless we first learn about our own culture, unless we learn properly about our oral tradition, our way of life, we should not jump into uh, this mix and match culture like how we are trying to follow other popular cultures that is around us. Second question is, can there be limits set today on authenticity without blocking these networks available to people today to ex exercise expression? Everybody has a right to express yourself, but the, when it comes to the question of authenticity, authenticity lies in, uh, when it comes to authenticity, the thing that I want to say here is that when I don't understand the, authentic uh, traditional ornaments or traditional clothes of my own tribe, then how am I to understand the beautiful earrings that belongs to another tribe that I'm putting on? For example, um, this is, uh, this is good. I, I may take some time, but even in our tribe, uh, in, in among the Sema, there was a huge controversy regarding a Sema Mekala, where in the past it was said that that particular Mekala existed and uh, it was supposed to be uh, woven by a woman who killed a warrior. And the Mekala was there. But the problem is at present, nobody knows how it looked like. The Mekala story is there, the narrative is there, the existence of the Mekala is there, but no one knew about it. So the Sumitoti Moho, what they did was that they went all the way to London and then they they uh, they they came to know that JP Mills had taken that um, and had uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the museum there. So they went there and they saw it, but again, the, this was not. Uh, very proper, so they came back and till now one has been commissioned to uh, weave that particular mekala. So the question of authenticity and uh, giving right to the people, uh, giving the right to the people to express themselves in this way, I think without really understanding, without really uh, knowing your culture, this expression, this freedom of expression to a certain extent has to be controlled until we come to the stage where it is uh, it's not causing any harm to us because in the future it's going to be um, a big problem. Thank you. I don't know. Um, if can I just, um, uh, that's very interesting that you bring up the point which uh, I had given in my presentation about the cloths being in Peterbos Museum. And actually, um, Ketoli and uh, uh, Cheshali, they had come. And they had seen the cloths and taken the photographs which were published in the uh, in the souvenir that was published by the Sumi Women's uh, Society organization <laughs> back in Nagaland. And it would be uh, here, I just want to ask you one thing, if you could identify which particular cloth was the one that was taken by JP Mills, we could actually get very good photographs back to the community for the weavers to weave from it because there's a whole project that is going to start from january onwards where we are uh, documenting all the naga textiles photographing them again to have standard photographs and we can actually take more photographs of that particular cloth and send it back to the community with detailed photographs of the graphics so that would be very great so um, I would like to get in touch with you. Um, and also, uh, just quickly, let me just add, there are, when you mentioned JP Mills, actually, I have come across a cloth about which JP Mills says that this particular kind of cloth is becoming very popular. It was recently designed. And that is what is now known as the traditional Mekla and, um, you know, the, um, the stole of 
of the Sumi Naga. So I was also taken aback, you know, looking at that, that, and also to the idea that tradition is ever changing. Tradition is not static. Tradition is what is handed over to the next generation, but every generation adds to it. So that is something for us to keep in mind that it is not static. Every generation is adding its own point. And there, uh, the story of um, cloths, of warrior cloths for women is common to other communities too. And there is a particular uh, Mekla. I mean, those who are Lotha, they would realize that the Ezum clan has a particular Mekla, and, um, uh, which is actually worn only by the Ezum women. And that has similar stories. So there are overlapping stories also of women, uh, women's bravery. Now, one we, for a last um, question for a third speaker, uh, Shimbresia. And that is about, you mentioned a very interesting thing that in 1940s, Feast of Merit was banned. It is very intriguing to know why. What kind of ideology was there to ban it? And also what, what kind of strategies are taking place now to bring some kind of egalitarianism or to tell people who are, um, who are wealthy, how to give back to the community? Is there a certain kind of strategy strategy that is being developed? And uh, oh my goodness, there are there are some other questions. We please look at them. The other speakers, there are some questions for you. Maybe you can send the answer in the chat. Shimresia, please unmute yourself and answer. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question. The feast of merit uh, was banned because it, it was considered uh, to be indulging in um, voluptuous activity uh, because the Feast of Merit involves drinking lots of rice beer, which makes people drunk. So uh, the Western missionaries thought that this, is, this will create a chaos in the community. People will fight and there will be lots of problem to control them. That, that, that was one of the main reasons. But the timeline that I have given 1940s, it, it is a rough assumption that I made because Christianity came to Ukru in 1896. So, but then people did not readily accept it. The dussel and struggle was there. So I just estimated the time because in Nagaland, uh, the latest piece of merit that was witnessed was in uh, 1962, I think. So in Manipur, I, I just assumed the timeline. Uh, regarding the redistribution of wealth, uh, it is a very um, complex issue, the question of individualism and collectivism, the dichotomy, the dichotomy that is existing in the society. Uh, let me give one example. The governance system in the Dankul Nagas uh, is administered by the village council, which are traditionally uh, inherited by clan system. But then uh, among the 200 or so villages of the Dankul Nagas in India, excluding uh, those in Myanmar, uh, around 150 villages are uh, governed by the still governed by the traditional chiefs, but around 50 villages are now governed by elected chairpersons. So this is one of the reasons why I cite Weber, the uh, rational legal authority, the shift to that direction. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding the redistribution of wealth. Uh, I don't know what strategy is being devised by the community, but um, the age-old community and their values are slowly dwindling away. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, also about the Feast of Merit, you, um, I think recently there was a paper by, um, actually Anungla Ayer has written about it and also Yele Wouters about, about um, you have the Christmas feast, but also during the election time, there are also feasts. So, you know, that how it takes up a different um, color. 
and different uh, ways of feasting. And also then with feasting, you're also buying some kind of um, response from the people, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> what we call uh, support. So that is also there because feasting, uh, as I understand, uh, was also to create relationship with clans, uh, with who one had brotherhood outside the village. I now, you know, different communities have different ways, but also feasting is also to patch up relationships when there is a any argument how two villages or two clans patch up. And we had a. Uh, we had a very interesting such feasting uh, that took place in, um, uh, when was it? It was in 2006, 2006 in Konoma between the two clans after a certain incident that took place where the second in command was killed. And after that, the two clans had not talk, spoken to each other. I don't know whether you know about that um, uh, uh, Sacre, Sacre's commemoration ceremony, 50 years in two clans, one was to whom Fizo belonged, one to whom Sacre belonged. So those clans got together after 50 years of not being in communication as such, after much effort by, uh, um, by several people actually. So, um, okay, now uh, what I would say is that uh, there are lot of comments there, but we are running out of time. And I will just say that uh, this conversation should continue between the scholars and the audience outside this uh, session also. And most of you are, uh, hopefully you will meet and you will communicate and you uh, please happily exchange emails. Uh, but this was a very good session. I learned a lot from all of you and those who are pursuing their PhDs, I wish you all uh, best of luck and um, I'm sure you will come up with very good thesis and please what um, what uh, uh, Miss Sue um, said that we need to persuade our state government's educational department to make sure that the PhD thesis and they are very good PhD thesis that are there in Shodh Ganga but they should also see the light of the day and there should be some kind of publication initiative that sh should be there and these PhDs have to come to light because it's PhDs are done to share knowledge and such knowledge should be shared and all these textbooks and things I think there should be probably Naga Scholars Association and um, NSF they can put forward this proposition that such kind of text should be written by the Naga themselves they are very well qualified Nagas and they should be the ones who would be putting forward these information, not some kind of a slap dish, you know, a cut and paste uh, text that we see. Thank you so much. And I'll give it to um, Mr. Coco now to conclude and thank everyone who has helped to make this session a success. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you, the presenters, for the insightful, thought provoking, enriching, and informative session. Or through your presentation. And also thank you, Chair, for your well-meaning interventions and elaborations on the work presented. And uh, also I want to acknowledge and thank the rapporteurs for doing the tedious job to put uh, this whole session on record. And also thank you, um, EJU Trainer, for helping us with the technical duties of the whole event. Uh, and I thank all the participants for participating uh, in, by listening to the presentation, by raising questions and comments to make the more uh, the whole exercise uh, very enriching. Um, thank you so much. Now over to uh, our president for some information. To you, bro. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Coco, for managing the session so well. And special thanks to, of course, uh, none other than Dr. Vibha Joshi. I was very happy. Actually, I was on the street when I messaged her, forcing her rather <laughs> to accept her to chair the session, not only present a paper, and she was 
uh, worried whether it is clashing with any, any of our other engagement, but fortunately it was not. So she accepted. And because of your, uh, your presence, it has really contributed so much for the success of this webinar. So thank you very much. Of course, our session organizer has already thanked all the participants and the pres ever present this, but as president of the NSA, since I'm also getting this opportunity, let me also take this opportunity to thank all the paper presenters for the lovely, very engaging, you know, uh, presentation which you have uh, done today, and to all the participants for your, you know, for your effective uh, participation, making the webinar a grand success. Well, I have entered here for a very important purpose. That is. At 7 p.m. today, India timing, 7 p.m., uh, we will be sharing the link immediately. Of course, we have already shared, but in case if any one of you have missed, we will continue to share on social media. I would like to say that we are having the valedictory function at 7 p.m. today, 7 p.m. Indian timing, okay, 7 p.m. And we have invited a very respected and a very prominent personality from the state, and none other than uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Wati Ayer, who is uh, well a very well-respected personality in the state, and also he is uh, you know Professor Emeritus at Oriental Theological Seminary Dimapur, and also the convener of the FNR. So I take this opportunity to invite all of you to please uh, join us because we are also going to have more, you know, uh, uh, in a way like a lot of special presentation is also there. So once again, I would like to thank all of you for making the session uh, very interesting, very successful one. Thank you very much and see you soon at 7 p.m. 